Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Patty Le- an alcoholic, and that's my telephone number is I think sometimes we're far too anonymous in these rooms and uh, uh, if you ever want to call just buy the tape and call and we'll chit chat that's the truth we'll chit chat we will or we'll talk this is the book Alcoholics Anonymous what can I say it's uh, it's our source of authority and I read the book for a long time and and I every time I would read it, there would something new would pop out at me. And I read it for a long time, and, and all of a sudden, this popped out at me. And I've always considered this my terminal disclaimer. It gets it keeps a lot of well-meaning critics off my back after I talk. And it says each individual in their personal stories describes in his own language. <laughs> Did you hear that? describes in his own language. I don't give a damn about what you say when you're up here, and don't you care what I say when i up here, okay? This is my story. Don't try to live it for me. And it says in their own language, and from his own point of view, the way he established his relationship with God. So this lovely woman who read, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, with the hat. Mary. Mary. If Mary read... Today, if what she read was true, A, B, and C, that I'm an alcoholic, that Patty Locascio is an alcoholic, and that no human power, no human power in this room could keep me from drinking today, and that God could and would if he were sought, if that is true, and I believe it's true, then I'm supposed to tell you today how Patty is developing, I-N-G, a relationship with God as I understand God. See? And that's the only message I have to bring you. Now, this journey of finding this power greater than myself when you're perfect <laughs> was hard. <laughs> it was just hard, see? And, and I came to you really screwed up a lot about the ideas of the concept of God or higher power. And uh, before I get into my sad-ass little s- story, it's really sad. When I get to thinking about it, I cry a lot. It's really sad. It is. It is. You know? I just want to tell you, I want to thank, first of all, I have to thank the committee for inviting me, Rosa. Thank you. Rosa, Rosa is just a delight. I have to tell you this. And she's been uh, there for all these months, and she writes the most wonderful postcards and letters. One time she sent me this postcard, and it, I, had, I had to show my girlfriends and boyfriends. And it just it was filled up the whole day. She forgot to sign her name now. And it was just it just filled up. She gets more information and more news and more chit-chat on one little postcard than anybody I've ever known. She really gets her money's worth for 20 cents, I'll tell you. I know we alcoholics, when we come into AA, we get tighter in hell with money. But, uh, Rosa, you t- carry it to whole new dice. But she's a loving woman, and I really have enjoyed knowing you and your friendship. And I want to thank the committee for your love and your generosity. This is the very first time I've been invited to bring a guest. I I invited my husband, and my husband had a terrific accident October the 2nd, 1989. He doesn't do too well. He's 15 years sober. He has good long-term memory. He could sit and talk to you about 15 years ago and what it was like and what it was like when he came in and his sponsor and the steps and how he worked the program. But if you asked him what he did five minutes ago, he'd have a little trouble remembering that. So he came and he, um, uh, the, it, okay, I, we, we had made plans. I had told Rosa that I thought my husband was going to be able to come to this conference. And Tuesday, on a Tuesday, I woke up. And the thought came in my head, why don't you ask Barbara to accompany you? She's, uh, she would like it. Thursday, my husband said, I'm afraid of flying. I don't want to go on the airplane. I'm scared of the airplane. So Friday, when I went to the home group to our meeting, I said, Barbara, how would you like to go to uh, Portland, Oregon? There's a big conference there. And she said, 
yeah, I would like it. And I said, well, and your expenses will be taken care of. And she said, gee, I would like that. I have to back up and tell you, and I don't know why I said it this weekend, but what I do in AA, as far as these conventions are concerned and being asked to speak, I've always kept it from my home group and the area that I live in. When I go to meetings, I'm patty. I'm an alcoholic, and I go there to save my ass. And that's the way I want to keep it. So nobody knows in my area about things like this. And it's good for me. And that's all I have to say about that. So nobody knew. And so when I asked Barbara, she really didn't believe because she called me back and said, you really sure you want me to go? And I said, yes. And so on Barbara's behalf and my behalf, I want to thank this committee for really your your generosity and your love has been overwhelming. And uh, Darlin Harlan, if anybody ever gets a chance to pick you up at the airport, have Harlan do it. He knows the best jokes in the whole world. And we got to kiss the big tree and we did the whole tourist bit. But he's bad about feeding you. You have to tell him that you will not budge if he doesn't feed you, you know, every once in a while. And and that's now we'll get on to my sad ass story. Every time I, I get into this part of it, it seems like it's just, it just gets less and less necessary to talk about it. But I believe today that unless you know where I come from, you can't appreciate where I'm at today. So, we, But we, we will address it. My mother was a Canadian Indian Ojibwa. You all call them Chippewas sometimes, but the Ojibwa is the, is the name for it. When I was eight years old, I got taken away from that mother, and I was put in a home of a man who called himself my father, and he was a Sicilian. My mother was not a nice woman. That's all I have to say about that. My mother was a full-blown alcoholic. My mother was illiterate. She was a street whore, and that's how she did her thing. We didn't eat. My sister and I, there was an older sister, Tina, And she took care of me and raised me. She was three years older than myself. Now, the family, my mother's family, are Indians. And I don't, y'all should know what Indians living in this part of the country look like. They look like Indians. They were tall, Ojibwas are tall, and the black hair parted down the middle, and the beautiful bronzed skin, gorgeous high cheekbones, beautiful people. My mother was drop-dead gorgeous, and my sister is unbelievable. They were all six foot. My sister is six foot one. My mother was six foot. Uh, my uh, uncles and aunties, they were all big. Jo- and I'm five foot five and a half. I've got white skin and red hair, and, and, and I'm an Irish person, you know. What the truth, now the truth of my whole upbringing is that I got switched in the hospital. I'm really an Irish person that got switched by some drunken nun in Providence Hospital in Washington, D.C. on July 30th, 1939. That's what really happened. And somewhere on God's green earth, there's a 59-year-old woman that's six foot, and she's got hair parted down the middle, black. She's got beautiful bronze skin, high cheekbones, and her mother are two five-foot Irish people, white skin and red hair. That's the real truth of the whole damn thing. Mother was not a nice woman. She uh, uh, she was a nice person. She wasn't a mother, but she was a nice person. My mother hated me because I was white, and my mother told me that often. And my mother abused me. My mother uh, beat me, ran my arms through wash machine ringers, and it's starting at about four years old. My mother used to let men come in and have sex with me, and she would get big money out of that. That was mommy dearest. And that sister of mine saved my life because that sister protected me from my mother on more than one occasion. We didn't eat on a regular basis. We would go eight, nine, ten days without eating. So when I was eight years old, they took me away from her and they gave me to my uh, this man who called himself my father. And at the time, I think I weighed 50 pounds. I was dying of tuberculosis. And that's the two killers of Indians in this country, alcoholism and tuberculosis. And I was dying of tuberculosis, malnutrition, and I had rickets so bad, my legs were so bowed, I couldn't stand up. And that's the patty that came to Daddy. Daddy abused me too, but Daddy didn't lay a hand on me. Daddy ignored me. And Don, you know exactly what I'm talking about when a Sicilian ignores you. I promised the, this blonde over in the uh, half measures availed us nothing section. Raise your hand up, darling. 
<laughs> Raise your hand. I tell her about my uh, character defect about blondes. In the house that my father owned, a very wealthy home, very, very wealthy home, uh, my father didn't know I existed. He had no idea I existed, so he had adopted this gal. He had never had children. And her name was Patricia Ann, and my name was Patricia Ann. So he changed her name to Patsy and my name to Patty, and I hated the son of a bitch right off for changing my name without my permission. And Patsy was beautiful. Patsy was blonde, natural blonde, drop-dead beautiful. She had peaches and cream complexion. She had the most winning personality. If you didn't love Patsy, something was, something was seriously wrong with you. And everybody adored Patsy. She could come into this room and make anybody feel at ease and welcomed. You've met people like that. I hated the bitch. I just hated that bitch. Now, I have to tell you, she was dumb God. Darn, she was dumb. Now, I know that there are dumb blonde jokes, but this one was dumb. You know, but she had gifts. Somebody from the podium talked about gifts. And, and it's true, we all have gifts. And, and, and I hope uh, Patsy and I have made our amends uh, with one another. Now, I here I am. God blessed me with an inordinate amount of intelligence. Big brain. As a matter of fact, I got accused this morning at breakfast of having a head full of useless knowledge. Well, that's what happens to you, goddammit, when you're a bright person. You know, you have all this little facts floating around in your goddamn head, and you know all of this other little shit, you know. Now, most people like us don't have a lick of goddamn common sense. We don't know how to take that wonderful intelligence and apply it to everyday life. And I'm one of them. So here I have this beautiful blonde sister, drop-dead gorgeous, dumb. And here's this skinny, ugly little, and that's what I thought I was. And believe me, if you think you are ugly, then you are ugly. I don't care what you look like. If you think you're something, that's what you are. And I thought I was ugly and retarded and stupid. And nobody, I was an embarrassment to the Indian mother because I was white looking and I was an embarrassment to that goddamn Guinea greaseball dago wop because I was half Indian, because I was an engine. That's what they called me, an engine. So I kept my mouth shut. And every time Patsy brought home a D at school, my father would throw her a big goddamn party, a D. And I had all A's, all A's, except one time I bought home an A minus. And for all my years in school, I got an A minus was my lowest grade. He never let me forget I got an A minus, the son of a bitch. See? Now, that's the patty. I went to, oh, by the way, I went to 12 years of school in five and a half years. I started school when I was 10 years old. I had gotten out of the TB sanitarium. I was home for six months bed rest. And by the time I was 10, I started school. And by the time I was 15 and a half, I graduated high school. I'm a brain. See, I'm a brain. That's God's gift to me. And I understand my gifts today. And I love my gifts. And I also hope the hell that you love your gifts and realize that you have them. So I'm out 15 and a half years old, get a job at the State Department in Washington, D.C., and I'm on my way. And on the my birthday of my uh, 16th summer, I got a date. I had never had a date before. I was so ugly. I didn't have any bazooms. As a matter of fact, I was so flat-chested, my, my uh, chest would sink in this way, you know. And I had a terminal and chronic case of the zits, you know, the big purple ones with the pus running out of it. And my eyebrows grew together, and I looked like John L. Lewis and the hair. See, I'm a southerner by birth. And, and back in those days, southern ladies didn't shave their armpits or their legs. You know, that was the, you were a loose woman if you shaved your armpits and your legs. Well, I had this black stuff growing. You could plaque the damn stuff, you know. And, and I never had to wear black hose because all I had to wear was just go bare leg and people thought I had black hose on, you know. Just ugly, ugly. So I finally got a date. My father helped get me the, this date. And I call him affectionately from the podium, dog, for want of a better word, dog. I, it has nothing to do about you men. This is this person. Okay, are we cool with this? Well, anyway, old dog had three bellies. And I, I would look at him. He was just nasty. But he was socially acceptable to a mafia killer. There. You have your whole thing there. 
So we're going down to North Beach, Maryland. And, and we weren't supposed to go to North Beach, Maryland, because North Beach in the, in those days was where a place where, uh, drinkers and gamblers and loose women went. I, I just have told you that uh, to Southern people, you could be a lot of things, but if you were a woman, you could not drink inappropriately, and you could not be a loose, a loose woman. If you were a loose woman, you were never able to marry properly. And where I came from in the time I was born, my whole existence was going to be if I married properly. Southern women had to marry properly. Shit, I blew my chances when I slid out of the womb of marrying properly, for Christ's sake. You know. So we're headed down to North Beach, Maryland, and all I could think of when I was going down there, there was two conflicting thoughts. If my father finds out I'm in North Beach, Maryland, my father's going to kill dog. And then there, the other part of Patty, they couldn't wait to see what loose women look like and gambling and that music and Ewald's Tavern and that cold beer. Honey, I hadn't even had my first drink yet, and already my heart was pumping. That goddamn adrenaline was going boom, 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 boom. And we got down in there. We walked in there, and the smell. Now, Barbara loves perfume. She loves perfume. This alcoholic loves the smell of beer coming out of the old taverns. I just think, Oda, Oda Toilette, Coors Beer. There's nothing sweeter than the smell of old piss and beer. I don't, just, just, it sends, it, whew. I get a rush just thinking about it. And we walked into Ewald's Tavern and that old urine and beer smell and the slot machines were cranking. And I remember that slow music. Now, you know, hillbillies today, they call them country and western. Oh, they're so goddamn sophisticated. Don't even sound like country and western music, you know. But back then it was lay your head upon my pillow. Help me make it through the night. God damn, and you'd have a cold beer in one hand and a hot man in the other, Woo! and that music would start playing. God, that was as close to heaven as I was ever going to get, and I knew it. I knew it at 16 years old, see? And I had that Miller High Life beer, and if there's any newcomers in here today, please just bear with me. Don't sneak out. <laughs> Don't sneak out. We'll report you to your sponsor. See, even you people up there in that half measures availed us nothing section up there. God damn. It's like tourists. What's that? You couldn't afford the price of these tickets down here? <laughs> got plenty of seats down here. We even got some roped off like an accident, death scene. In Chicago, when they had that yellow shit, that means somebody done got shot. Probably your mama. So here I am sitting in Ewald's Tavern. I'm having, I had five Miller High Life beers. It's wet, cold, and delicious. The sweat's dripping off the bottle. I'm going, it's going down my throat. It hits my belly. There's a little explosion. Boom. I love Clancy when he talks about that. Nobody has yet in all of my years of AA described it like Clancy has. And I love him. I'll give him credit till the day I die. When that alcohol hit my belly, it didn't go anything but boom. It was a wonderful explosion. And after five beers, I was like the eagle. Have you ever seen the pictures of the eagles up on the mountaintops? Honey, whoo, I was flying. I was all powerful. There's nothing I couldn't do. The zits dropped off my face. My tits grew right in front of me. Man, whoo, I was hot. I was hot. I'd never danced with a man. I danced with every sucker in that place that day. And tell jokes. I had a terrific speech impediment. To this, I still have a terrific speech impediment. God damn it, here I was telling jokes. And they were laughing. And I had arrived. And even dog was starting to look good. <laughs> him and his three bellies. We might have been able to find him. I don't know if I'd have had another beer. Well, something happened. I had my first spiritual experience at the age of 16 sitting in Ewald's Tavern. And I want to tell you something about Alcoholics Anonymous. If you don't have a spiritual experience by God, you will have rude experiences. And if you don't have a spiritual awakening, you will have a rude awakening. Just stick around. We talked about it at that meeting last night, Thursday night, you know? When you sit around and, and, and the only thing you can do is just not drink and sit on your hands because life is shit. 
When I was new in the program, thank God that there are speakers that have the courage to stand up and say, when my problem started when I stopped drinking. I didn't come to AA and find wonderful, contented honeymoon sobriety. When I stopped drinking, my life turned to shit. And that's when the problem started. And that's when all the feelings and all the floods of things I had pushed down for years and years and years came bubbling. And it's like old methane gas just came bubbling up and it stunk. So where am I? Am I sat in? I'm in Ewald's Tavern. I'm having my fifth beer. And all of a sudden I had my first spiritual experience. The only way I can describe it to you is there's a scene out of the, um, the Wizard of Oz. When, what is her name? Glenda, the good witch. Remember when she came out of the, of the, in the bubble, you know? And here's old Glenda coming out. I'm sitting there and old dog is just smiling at me like some bitch. He's just smiling. He's just grinning. And he's just, man, he's, he's thinking. I read his mind. He was thinking it's only going to take one more beer. <laughs> and old Glenda pops and she said, oh, darling. She says, I'm going to give you the ability to read minds. And pop, she disappeared. And I looked at old dog, and I read his mind. And I started grinning at him, and he was grinning at me. And I was grinning, and he was grinning. And I had the sixth beer. And I was thinking to myself, you son of a bitch, if you live to be a thousand, you won't get in my drawers. (laughs) And he didn't, and I never saw dog again. But that was my first drinking experience. Now, something magical and mystical happened that day to me, and from what you tell me, sitting around the tables of Alcoholics Anonymous, the same thing happened to you. We never drank because we liked the taste of it. We may have liked it, we may not have liked it, but we liked what it did every time we put it in our bodies. And every time I drank, it took me right up to the mountaintop, and I became the eagle again. And God, I was free. And I wasn't ugly and stupid anymore, and I wasn't skinny, and I wasn't flat-chested, and I didn't have a speech impediment. I was pretty, and I could talk. And you think I was going to give that up? You're out of your mind. And I didn't get falling down sloppy drunk. If you're waiting to hear me say that I got falling down sloppy drunk and passed out and had my first blackout, man, are y'all in? That's, That's somebody else. That's another speaker. Uh, alcohol worked for me. Alcohol worked for a long time for me. And, and I did things and I went places and I made a lot of money. A lot of money. And please, for Christ's sake, don't be so ignorant to come up and ask me how I made the money. You know? By the time I was 20, I had big red hair, big tits. I'd had a baby and all the things that should have happened to me happened. Had a 19 inch waistline and I was hot. And I knew it because I drank the goddamn alcohol. And I was in Chicago. It was January 1959, and I, I, John Murphy, God love, he's still sober and he's still alive. And he was selling me real estate up on the near north side, up by the Edgewater, the old Edgewater Beach Hotel. And he said to me, there's a meeting on Sunday night at the Bismarck Hotel. I think you ought to go to it. And I thought it was a real estate meeting. (laughs) <laughs> God damn A&A. <laughs> he took me there. And I thought that was a hoot. I really was. I was not offended. I thought it was a hoot. I thought the man cares that I drink too much. You see, I've always known I'm an alcoholic. I've never had problems with the first part of the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have always, up until February the 8th, 1977, had problems with the second part of the first step. When you're young, pretty, and rich, it's harder for you people to convince somebody like me that my life's unmanageable. Thank you. I'm doing fine. I have a lot of money. What what about you? Oh, I'm sober, and I live in the back of my car, and I don't have any front teeth. (laughs) I was around then. I heard him talk. (laughs) <laughs> when he did, before he got spiritual and got teeth. <laughs> so I stayed in AA. I don't know why. I have to tell you, though, about my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was a hoot. It was really a hoot. They were all men. 
They were all men at this meeting, and all of them were over 50, and all of them looked like they had been dead three days, and somebody forgot to bury them. They had cobwebs hanging off of them, you know, and they were just crotchety, and they were just mean-looking and nasty, just ugly. Just your garden-variety old alcoholic back in those days, recovering or otherwise. And God love them, this is what they did. They dedicated the whole meeting to helping me. All their comments, all their thoughts were geared toward me. And for a full hour, they went on and they talked about what alcohol had done to their lives and how alcohol had brought them to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And they talked about defects of character and the importance of finding a God. And I sat and I listened. I paid attention to them. And at the end of the meeting, this one especially old crotchety son of a bitch looked at me and said, Hey, girl, you want what we have? <laughs> and I, th I, I thought to myself, I hope the hell it's not catching, see? <laughs> but it stuck around. Now, here's the part of my story that differs just a little bit from other people's. I never left AA. I never left AA. Pat, I just loved it. It was the first time in my life I'd ever been to a place where people, especially men, didn't want anything from me. And I love you. I had never been to a place like that. Never. Thank you for laughing. Really, thank you. Because you understand. So I stayed in AA. Stayed here. Went to a meeting almost every day. Got drunk every night, one day at a time. <laughs> See? And toward the end, and toward the end, when alcohol stopped working for me like it did for all of us, I used to sit in meetings and drink. And back in those days, nobody said anything to you. Oh, some newcomer would say, God, look at that girl over there. She's drinking. And the old-timers would say, oh, that's just Patty. Leave her alone. If she lives long enough, she'll make it. Today they call the cops on you. Isn't it funny that we in Alcoholics Anonymous don't know how to handle wet alcoholics anymore? Isn't that sad? We turned over our sponsorship work and we've turned over our treatment programs and we've, or I'm sorry, our 12-step work to treatment programs and detox centers. That's, that's sad that we don't know how to handle wet alcoholics today. When's, if you don't believe me, ask yourself, when is the last time you went out on a real honest-to-God 12-step call? When's the last time? I've lived in the city of Chicago in the Cowhole Calumet area 19 years, and I, I've gotten a total of three calls. We have 4,000 meetings a week in Chicago, 4,000 meetings a week. Chicago in and of itself is an area assembly. And I've gotten three calls in 19 years. But enough of that. I, I'll get off my soapbox about that. I think we AAs ought to get back to taking care of our own people. I, I think uh, the insurance companies are going to see that we do that, huh? But as long as I'm on my soapbox, we better talk about chemical imbalance. Jesus, it's the new uh, fad thing. I don't know about out here in Oregon, but the other uh, couple of months ago, I sat in a meeting in Indiana, and there were 12 of us, and seven were on Prozac, uh, Zoloft, and Xanax because they were chemically imbalanced and depressed. You show me one alcoholic that comes to recovery that is not depressed. <laughs> now, please, please, I understand that there are people who are medically uh, depressed and need medication. I know that. So don't come after, up here afterwards and give me some shit. Please don't. And I understand that there are people that are need to be on medication. I'm, I, I'm not for, I'm just saying that because the medical profession and the insurance industry has lost their little, uh, uh, star with alcoholism and substance abuse, they've just switched all their thing now to this chemical imbalance. Be very careful of any doctor that wants to put you on something for manic depression. Be very careful. It's maybe do yourself a favor and take your sponsor and go get a second opinion, you know. That always helps. Usually they, the alcoholic, uh, doctors don't want to talk to two recovering people in the same room because they're afraid you're suing for malpractice. That's enough of that. Sounds like I hate doctors, doesn't it? No, I don't. I really don't. I just tolerate the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get on lawyers next. 
So, so anyway, here I am, um, uh, full-blown alcoholic, um, and I've been drinking for a lot of years, and all the things, all those wonderful things I told you about, the eagle up on the mountain, and the freedom, and the sense of power, and the sense of everything, is now gone. And because I come from an Italian family, have you ever heard of a female Don? Have anybody in this room ever heard of a female Don? No? It's because we don't get it because our plumbing's on the inside and the other guys, their plumbing's on the outside. And that's about, and they have a pea brain, most of them, anyway. (laughs) But my father had something I wanted. Anybody know the word that my father had that I wanted? P-O-W, right, Don? P-O-W-E-R. I loved it. I love power. And most alcoholics sitting in this room, and you al too, let's fess up to it. You like it, too. It's savory, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Roll it around in your mouth. Power. Mm-hmm. Tastes good, doesn't it? It even feels good. Power. Power. We're even supposed to pray for the goddamn thing in step 11, aren't we? Power. Power. See? So I wanted power, and I equated in my little pea brain up here the difference, uh, or the power that my father had with money. That's what I wanted. I thought if I got enough money, I could get power, the same power he had. And so it, 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 somewhere along the line, I'd go into bars, and I was tired of being treated like a second-class citizen. And, of course, I was going to lower and lower and lower and lower bars. And finally, I got tired of putting up with the bullshit simply because I was female and had tits at the time. So I carried the great equalizer. It's called a 38. <laughs> Get you instant respect anywhere you go. And, and people would start mouthing off, and I'd say, leave me alone. I want to drink. I'm not here to go to bed or have sex. I just want to drink. See? And I'd ask them politely three times. And after the third time, if they didn't leave me alone, I just blew their kneecap off. And the fourth time, I would aim a little bit higher. See? And that's what I did. And I became a vicious, mean, ugly drunk. And I'm not proud of that, and I don't brag about that. That's just the way it was. That's the truth. I became a mean, vicious person. And all that hate and all that venom that had been done to me, I took out on the rest of the world. I was going to make the whole... I, I don't, I've never considered myself a prejudiced person. Never. I don't think I am. I just hated everybody. And everybody was going to have to pay for what was done to me. And I started shooting cops. It was a funny thing. I used to like to fight, and cops would come to the bars and try to break up the fight, and I would just whip out my thirty-eight and shoot a cop. You know, shoot a cop. You thought about it. I did it. (laughs) See? And I started going to jail, and I started going to prisons, and I did uh, five times in prison. I'm not proud of that. It just happened. It's a fact. I did it. And my father would get me out every time. The fourth, uh, the fifth time, the last time I was sentenced to prison was 1972. I was sentenced to four counts of murder, one, and a fifth sentence for being a habitual criminal, and it was Lowell Penitentiary in Florida, and I was guilty. And I didn't care anymore. I didn't care whether I lived or died. I was so full of hate and venom. I hated everything and hated everybody, and I didn't know that the thing I hated the most was Patty. So now that we've got over that little sad-ass story... Now we'll get to the good stuff. (laughs) My father got me out one last time and and let it be known through my godfather that he no longer cared whether I lived or died. And believe me, and where I come from, the kind of family I come from, that's a death sentence. When when your father, who is uh, doesn't care whether you live or die. And I knew that all I had to do was step out of line one more time and I would be dead. Not by the cops, but by my father. So I went to where the place where I thought I belong, I went to Skid Row. And that's where I spent the next uh, five years of my life. There was a period, November 14th, 1975, why I remember that, I don't know. But I had been going to meetings in Lakeland, Florida, and there was this man named Bob Terry. He's dead now. And he used to say, baby girl, he says, for Christ's sake, God loves you so much. He said, give yourself a chance. Give AA a chance. Just come to us. Come to us and let us love you. Come to us and let us help you. And I'd laugh and I'd say, Bob, I said, I'm one of those poor unfortunates. I I can't get this shit because I don't believe in your God. And on February the 8th, 1977, 
the miracle happened. And somebody said it in the newcomer meeting at noon today. For Christ's sake, please don't leave before the miracle happens. Somebody said it in the meeting last night also. Don't leave before the miracle happens. Because on February the 8th, 1977, I woke up, and for the first time in my life, I wanted to live. I wanted to really live. I didn't want to live the way I was living anymore, the angle shooting, the chucking, the conniving, the jiving, the, the lying, the shortchanging. I didn't want to be that way anymore, and I didn't know how to live any other way, and I was scared shitless. And I said the prayer, will the God of the AAs help me to, do, to not drink today? I'll do what I'm told to do no matter what. And I don't know what happened, and we try to piece it together. Those folks that love me down in Florida, we've tried to piece it together, but they found me. That I was living up under these, this bridge at Lake Eloise, Florida, and they found me in Lakeland, Florida, crawling down the seventh floor corridor of the Lakeland General Hospital, and that's where they held a noon AA meetings, nooners. And Bob Terry was there. He was working there. And I weighed about 600 pounds. I was covered with syphilis and wine sores and running pus and had no hair, no teeth, no fingernails, and didn't resemble a human being. And he propped me up against the wall. And he looked and he stared and he said, Patty. And he hugged me, the shit and the vomit and the pus. And he hugged me, and he hugged me, and he hugged me, and he said, Welcome back, babe. And then I died. <laughs> and for six months, I died. My heart would stop. I only have 15% of my liver. I blew my pancreas. I have diet, alcohol-induced diabetes. I have just enough liver to get along. I found that out. They've been wanting to yank out my left kidney for 21 years, and I still have it. And I keep telling my goddamn doctor, I'll to have a toe dance on your grave, honey. <laughs> and so I died. My heart would stop. And they put the paddles on. And I started staying alive. And my heart started working like it was supposed to work. And my liver started functioning, and the enzymes started coming back. And then they sent this four foot eleven dynamo to my room. Oh, by the way, I gotta tell you this. I gotta thank Alanon and Alateen. And let me tell you the reason why. Lakeland General Hospital, I didn't have any money, I didn't have any insurance, I didn't have anything. And uh they said they would keep me if AA would provide for somebody every two hours. And there was a lot of recovering alcoholics, but there was a lot of members of the Al-Anon family groups and the older Alateens that would take their two-hour shifts. And I'd wake up, I'd come to, and here was this strange face smiling, saying, Hi, Patty. Hi. <laughs> What's your name? Helen, Phyllis, Sue, Joe, Jim, Don. And I woke up one time and there was this four foot eleven uh evil looking thing <laughs> just evil looking smiled great big smile and my father had told me when i was a little girl there were only two types of people that smiled a lot retarded people and truly truly evil people smile a lot <laughs> truly evil people smile a lot and i was trying to figure out what the hell this bitch was whether she was retarded or evil and she said hello darling i'm your sponsor she said, my name is Katie Haygood And they have assigned me to be your sponsor And she said, welcome to sobriety Here are the things that you will do If I am to remain your sponsor Now, I wasn't lucid I, I was almost, I wasn't wet brain But I was damn damp, honey, I'll tell you And, uh, and she started rattling off the things I had to do One, it didn't mention steps Did not mention steps, newcomers you know what she mentioned to me? We will be self-supporting through our own contributions. You will get a job. A legal job. One that you pay taxes on. Huh? 
So they would take me to meetings, and Crawford, who was 14 years sober, and Crawford walked on his heels. And Crawford wasn't all there, but he, he, he was sober. And he had a big old white DeSoto, and he would put me in the back. And he would take me to St. Joe's meeting every Monday night. And, and he never had any shock absorbers on this damn white car. And Jesus, and he'd go 90 miles an hour. And we'd hit a set of railroad tracks and come down five miles later. That's how bad the shock absorbers were. And he drove in the, um, pa- the, um, the lane where the people parked, the parking lane. And he'd come, he'd see a parked car and he'd drive and go this way and he'd go out in traffic. And right there on, uh, highway, I think it is, Oh, I'm, my brain is not working right. I think it's 41 coming through. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's 30. So anyway, we'd be coming down the parking lane, and I was in the back seat, and he was turned around. He was trying to tell me about the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in 15 minutes, see? And he had to tell me all about the big book, Alcoholics, in 15 minutes, and I'm going, <gasps> we'd come up behind a park car, and he'd push out, and then a great big old semi would come down and honk, 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 and put the air brakes on. i go, <gasps> Like this, and, and we come up, and there's another park car, and he was trying to tell me that uh, pitiful and incomprehensible to Mars Lation, but we can get we can get healthy if we have an entire psychic change, because an alcoholic that doesn't drink, it just doesn't drink, it doesn't have an entire psychic change, becomes restless, irritable, and <gasps> and I'd go like this, and just disc- oh, he'd pull out, and then he'd turn around again. We become restless, irritable, and discontented, uh, and we won't drink again. And so that night when he took me back to the hospital, he says, I'm not a medical person, but I want to tell you you ought to have that goddamn asthma checked out, girl. <laughs> and that's the way it started. Six months later, they released me from the hospital, and, and Katie took me to her house. And I hear all the time you ought to carry the message, not the alcoholic. And if you said that to Katie today, she'd tell you to F off. I know we don't say the F word in Oregon. And she'd tell you to F <laughs> That's what I was told today. I hear it a lot at this meeting, though. She told me to alf off, and she'd do what she damn well wanted to do. She was 38 years sober, and when you're sober as long as I am, then you can tell me what to do. That's what she would say back in those days. So she took me in her house, and there were 12 conditions to my life parole from prison, and there were 14 conditions to Katie's sponsorship. First one was I had to zip the lip and cross the legs. I said, how long? She said, we generally start with a year. I said, does that mean what I think it means? She said, yes. She said, you have nothing to offer, my home group. You are a sick, suffering alcoholic who only knows how to screw up your life one day at a time. Unless you have worked the steps which are written in the past tense, which means you have worked them, do not report on them. Please do not tell us how you are going to take the fourth step Tell us how you did it. And until you do it, shut up. <laughs> now, today, you would get reported to the General Service Conference in New York and the intergroup simultaneously if you told a newcomer to shut up. You know what we're doing in Alcoholics Anonymous today? We're loving the bastards to death. <laughs> you don't agree? In 1939, our success rate was 50% came and never left. 70, 25% left and came back in never to leave again, and 25% had improvement. I never knew what the hell the improvement was, but that's it. Today, our success rate is what, 10 to 12%? <laughs> See? I'm a numbers person. I'm an accountant now. I love, I love numbers. See? So there were all these conditions. I couldn't ride in the same car with the man unless there was another member of AA present. Katie later told me it was not to protect me, it was to protect the men of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> she said, you are a snakeette. She said, we have a lot of snakes in AA, but you are a snakeette. She said, you're a people abuser. And I abused women and I abused men. I'm guilty of both. I abused whoever had the money for me to get my next drink in your pocket. I try to relieve it as nicely as I could and leave a smile on your face. <laughs> but I got it any way I could. Okay. So I started going to meetings. And I had to go fill out job, five job applications. You very seldom tell me, I hear me tell you from the podium simply because I don't have enough time about how I work the steps. But believe me, I work the steps. But i got to tell you about taking action. Action is a word. It's a verb, I believe. And action means that I took, I got on, I got off my dead ass and got on my feet. And I had to go fill out five job applications every day. I said, Katie, nobody will hire me. Look at me. 
look at me, I weigh over 300 pounds and, and I don't, I'm just getting a crew cut and, and uh, the, my skin is starting to clear up. She said, God will provide. And so I go fill out my little resume. I had my little resume. It wasn't much, but it was a resume. And I go and I take it out to the, the, um, the phosphate industry plants in Bartow and Mulberry. And, and sometimes they'd look at my little resume and they'd laugh. The human resources, the personnel department back in those days, they'd laugh. They'd just rip it. They'd rip up my resume right in front of my face, laugh, and drop it in the bucket. Now, I want to tell you about Katie Haygood. Katie, ha see, I couldn't tell the dumb, um, you know, that word, to where to go. Here's what I had to do. Because I had to get up and clean up that morning and make myself as fresh in my little outfit. I had to press it and make it pretty. And I had to smell good and look good. She says I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now I had to be a program of attraction. And she made me go over to that man and shake his hand and say, I know that I've taken time from your busy day. And although you don't have an opening for me now, maybe in three months you will consider my employment again. Thank you very much. Good day. And she said, when you turn and leave the office, you will put your head up and your tits out. You are a precious child of God. You are a recovering member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you have a right to be on this green earth. And I did it. And I did it, and I didn't want to do it. I want to go get the damn resume out of the wastebasket and put it right under his goddamn nose and say, here, you son of a bitch, when you run out of Charmin, use this. <laughs> but I didn't. And I got a job, and I went to my home group. And we had a big celebration. Patty got a job. Patty got a job. She's washing dishes for a buck fifteen an hour. Big old millionaire drinking. Now she's washing dishes for a buck fifteen an hour. And Katie says, got to get down on my knees and thank God for my sober job. That night I got down on my knees and thank God for my sober job. Dear God, thank you for another shitty day of sobriety, and thank you for my shitty job. Amen. Good night. <laughs> And we used to sit at meetings. There were nine of us, nine women that came into Alcoholics Anonymous at the same time in Lakeland, Florida. And all nine of us are still sober and still active in the program Alcoholics Anonymous. And we used to sit there at the meeting and we'd look at her. And one day I leaned over to Judy Fox and I said, Judy, imagine there's a zipper around her head. And you could unzip it and you could peel back the skin. I said, you know what you'd find in there? She said, what? I said, a goddamn roulette wheel. Now watch. And she looked at her, and I, she said, yeah. I said, and her brain is like that little ball, that little pea. Now watch it. It's going around and around. And every time she has a thought, ah, it drops in one of those slots. Now watch her, watch her. And all of a sudden, clunk, she'd look up like this, and she'd look over at one of us, one of the nine of us, and she'd say, I want to see you after the mating tonight. So we'd all sit at the meeting the next day and we'd watch for the goddamn roulette wheel to go around and around and around and clunk. And she'd look over at Judy Fox and she'd say, I want to see you after the meeting tonight. And we'd go, Phew, thank God it's not me. It's not my turn in the barrel. Now, she pointed to me a lot. And one night she said to me, how much money do you owe? I said, well, you know my eighth step. I made the eighth step list. I owe, give or take, $1,000, $250,000. She said, when are you going to pay them back? I said, well, I thought this was a new way of life. We could just declare bankruptcy and wipe the slate clean. She says, that's stealing. Alcoholics Anonymous don't go bankrupt. That's stealing. To steal is to drink and to drink is to die. You will pay them back. You will write them letters, every one of them, and you will start out, Dear sir, dear madam, I honor the debt. Period. Oh, God. And I went to groups and I griped about it. Don't ever go to meetings across town and bitch about your sponsor because it's going to get, that will get back faster than you will get back. And I found myself sitting on my little bed in my first sober little apartment. Dear bloodsucker, I honor the debt. It was mostly lawyers I owed the goddamn money to. I honor the debt, period. I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm into a new way of life. 
I'm going to pay you the AA payment plan dollar down, dollar a week. Love, Patty. So that's how it started. Every Thursday night, we'd work the budget. I know you're watching the time. Every, every Thursday night, we'd work the budget. And one night, I got real testy. Never get testy with your sponsor. That's rule number two. Never get testy with your sponsor. And I said, where do you? Where in the book does it say you work your budget with your sponsor on Thursday nights? She says, it's in there. You just haven't found it yet. <laughs> and every Friday, People's National Bank, I'd go in there and get $51 money orders. It cost 50 cents to buy the money orders, so it was $75 every week. And every week, and, and uh, the stamps, and I'd lick the stamps, and I'd send out that dollar every week, every week. Sitting in a meeting one night. Uh, by the way, when I asked her how I was going to pay back $250,000, you know what the bitch told me? God will provide. <laughs> Sitting there at the meeting, here's the roulette wheel going around and around. I want to see you after the meeting tonight. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I want you to go down to Avon Park Prison. They got an opening there on Monday night. I want you to go down there on Monday night. I want you to tell them that if anybody can stay out of prison, they can because you can. That's all you to tell them. That's all you got. You don't know anymore. Just tell them that. <laughs> it was a male max prison. And I'm supposed to go down there and tell them if I can stay out of prison, anybody can. I said, Katie, it's 150 miles down the road, 150 miles back. I don't have a car. God will provide. Went to the meeting, bitched about my sponsor. For 13 months, I made it down to Avon Park Prison every Monday night. And my message, you know what my message was? If I can stay out of prison, you can too. And that's all I got to give you. Good night. See you next Monday. <laughs> if I'd have told him any more, one time she, she heard, she says, I hear that your uh, group down that Avon Park Prison has increased. You got 80 guys now. One time she happened to drop by the uh, 2720 Club in Lakeland, Florida on a Monday night. Now, I had gone down to 115 pounds. My red hair had grown back. My tits were just as nice as they were before. My little night, and I had a dress down, way down there, and my skirt was way high. She said, oh, honey, this is a program of attraction, but we don't attract like that. Go home and get dressed. I, my, my attendance at my meeting at uh, Avon Park Prison dropped off drastically. <laughs> I was trying to get them suckers in one way or the other. It was a hoot. We went all over Florida. She always took me on 12-step calls. Always took me on 12-step calls. And she says, you just sit and shut up and tell them your name when I tell them to tell you your name. And you tell them that you're an alcoholic only by the grace of God in the program Alcoholics Nuns. That's what you got to offer them. And for some reason, I wanted her approval. Never could figure that one out. Sitting at a meeting one night, the roulette wheel's going around and around and around. She says, I want to see you after the meeting tonight. I said, yes, ma'am, now what? <laughs> she said, you're brilliant. I want you to go to college. I want you to become an accountant. God gave you a brain. I want you to use it. I said, yes, ma'am. I go to 10 meetings a week, Katie. I go to a meeting every day, two on Saturday, three on Sunday. I go to the Bartow talk, Detox meeting on Sunday. I I'm begin to sound like, what's his, the, the chair's name last night? Marlon? Marshall. Whiny ass. Where's Marshall? Whiny ass bastard. <laughs> St starting to sound like old whiny ass Marshall. Oh, man, I was doing all this service work. I, 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 and I was going 10 meetings a week, and I was working four part-time jobs. Washing them dishes, you know, cutting cloth two nights a week, a little secretary during the day, bookkeeper in the afternoon. And, uh, and she said, and I said, I don't have the time or the money to go to college. And you know what she said to me? God will provide. Went to one meeting too many. You know what I'm talking about, alcoholics, when you go to one meeting too many? You always hear what you're supposed to hear, right? You pray for the willingness. You ask God to give you the opportunity to hear the message that you're supposed to hear, and you show up. And there's my friend Skip sitting at the meeting, gay man. He had been a, a prostitute out on the streets, and now he was a big computer expert. He had gone to vocational rehabilitation and told them that the, he shouldn't be a whore anymore. He wanted to be a big computer guy, and they gave him the money to go to college. And he had just got his A&A &A degree. I didn't know the guy had gave A&A degrees, but he got one. 
And I went back to Katie that night and I said, oh, I can join vocational rehabilitation. She's, and you know what she said, that born again Republican, you know what she said? Sounds like my tax money to me. <laughs> and so I, I, I made the mistake of talking fast. You know, when alcoholics want something, we talk fast. And I said, but I'll pay them back. And I did. <laughs> I paid them back. So I went to vocational rehabilitation. I went to Polk Community College. I went to two years of college in one year. And now I was sober two years. And I made, got an offer from a steel mill in Hammond, Indiana, LaSalle Steel. And they wanted me to come to work for them for fifteen whole thousand dollars a year. And they were going to pay my way to Purdue, Purdue University for my junior and senior year. And I, I showed Katie and I thought Katie would turn me down flat. And you know what she said? Sounds like God is providing. And I I didn't want to leave. All of a sudden, I didn't want to leave because it was safe. And I went to Hammond, Indiana. And I met Barb. And I met Barb's sponsor, who was just as nasty as Katie Hagan. I remember I went to, I was in a meeting one night, and they had, it was the Saturday night. Remember our Saturday night meeting? They used to have two, three hundred people there. And God, they had some hot-looking men there. Whew, Jesus, my heart still jumps when I think about those hot looking men. And I had my skinny old high heels on, you know, the come, you know, the come do me hose or shoes and, uh, and, uh, and the black hose and I had my big old red hair and I went to the bathroom five times, you know, click, click, click to make sure all the men saw me. And I got up to go the fifth time she grabbed my arm. She said, piss in your pants. <laughs> That's her sponsor. And I stayed at the steel mill, and I graduated from Purdue, and uh, I went to wanted to write uh, my CPA exam, and the state of Indiana wouldn't let me because they didn't want people of my moral character becoming certified public accountants in their state. And I thought, oh, my God, and I went to the meetings and cried and cried and cried and cried, and poor old me, and I, here I am, a member of a good member of society today. I'm a taxpayer, and I'm a recovering member, and they won't let me write the CPA exam in Indiana. <laughs> And they said, oh, shut up. Take your head out of your ass, Patty. God will provide. Same thing in Indiana, they told me in Florida. And I go home one night, turn the TV on, there's this big old female lawyer. God love her heart. I wish I could call out her name, but she's not a member of AA or any other related. And she she was from the ACLU. And uh, she was helping somebody get their civil rights. And I called her up. And she turned me down flat, hung up on me. And I called her again because I found out, nay, if you want something and you want it bad enough and you think it's God's will for you, you go after it till you get it. <laughs> and I called her back again and I called her back again. And finally she took my case. She says, I'll take it, but you're going to do all the paperwork. And we sued the state of Indiana. And I'm going to tell you, it is a wonderful feeling being on the plaintiff's side instead of the defendant's side. <laughs> And I won. <laughs> and as we're leaving the courtroom, she looked at me, and she I'd never heard the woman cuss. I had never heard her cuss. She was just, you know, real straight. And she looked at me, and she said, God, you better pass, you bitch. <laughs> and I did on the first setting. Yeah, isn't that neat? That's a hoot. And I'm sitting at the steel mill after I pass my exam and everybody's happy for me. And my parole officer called me one day and he, uh, he did things that, uh, and not, thank God I know that today that not pro all parole officers are like this, but he used to try to make me do things to him. And I told, one day I told some of the guys at the steel mill that I was scared of my parole officer. And those guys at the steel mill who were not members of AA went with me every goddamn time I went to see my parole officer every Monday night uh, before I started going down to the prison. Yeah, people out there are willing to help us if we're willing to help ourselves, you know, because when I got sober, I started going back to that Michigan City prison the same way I'd gone back to Avon Park prison. And, and, and those guys would go to, with me just to make sure that that son of a bitch never fooled around with me. And, and I'm sitting at the steel mill one day, and I get a telephone call, and he says, Patty. And I started shaking. I started shaking. And I said, yes. He says, sit down. 
And I thought, oh, my God, they're going to bust me back. What did I do? What did I do? What did I do? And I started shaking, and my hands started shaking, my knees started shaking. And I sat down, and he says, I don't know what you did, but you're free. He said, the governors of three states have just signed your pardon. You have a complete pardon. You don't have a criminal record. Goodbye. And he hung up, and I started screaming. And everybody, and the whistles went off in the steel mill, and everybody was jumping up and down. And Patty's free, Patty's free, Patty's free. And the president came out, Frank Conney said, oh, go home for Christ's sake, take the day off, you're useless. <laughs> See, everything I looked for the bottle, everything I looked in the bottle to find, I found in sobriety, in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I got it. Now, before I close, i got to tell you about Bob Terry. When I moved to Hammond, Indiana, every year I would call down to Florida, and I would get Bob on the telephone. Every February the 8th, I would call him because it was my link. Katie had moved back to Arkansas, and I would call him up, and he'd answer the phone, and I'd say, Happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me, happy birthday, precious Patty, happy birthday to me. And he'd say, Oh, baby girl. You're still sober. And I'd say, thank you, Bob, for saving my life. And he'd say, I didn't save your life. God saved your life. And I'd say, shut up, Bob, and say thank you. And he'd say thank you. (laughs) I make trips to Florida to celebrate my dry date and pick up my toque usually two or three weeks after my dry date. And uh, when I was sober about 18 years, I noticed that Bob would be in the middle of a sentence and he'd stop, just stop. And I went into his lovely wife, Jenny, who's a wonderful, wonderful, was a wonderful member of al family groups. And I'd say, Jenny, what's wrong with Bob? She says, oh, Patty, we didn't want to tell you he's got Alzheimer's. So they, they sold their place in Florida and went back to the state of New York where their children were. And I called up that next February and I said, Jenny, I said, uh, how is he? And she said, oh, Patty, she said, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't remember anything. It, it just." And so I talked to her. After, and then after half an hour, I said, Jenny, I said, put him on the phone. Just put him on the phone. And she said, oh, I, I'll do it, Patty. But I, she said, I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want you to be hurt. So she put him on the phone. I sang, happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday, precious Patty. Happy birthday to me. And he said, oh, baby girl, you're still sober. talked a long time and we cried and and she was such a neat lady and I said to her can I call you February and she said yes and that next February I called her and I said happy birthday to me happy birthday to me happy birthday precious daddy Happy birthday to me. And I said, thank you, Bob Terry, for saving my life. And she said, oh, baby girl. She said, Bob didn't save your life. God saved your life. And I said, shut up, Jenny, and say thank you. And she said, thank you. (laughs) And we talked to one another a lot during the year. And uh, she said, "Uh, Patty, I got some news to tell you. I'm dying of leukemia. I didn't know what to say. I did not know what to say. And I said, Jenny, I'll call you in February. And she said, I know you will, baby girl. I know you will. This last February, I called up. By this time, she had been living with her children. I never knew Bob and Jenny's children. 
I never knew them. They're my age. They saw their father sober years and years. They saw their mother. They saw a happy home. And I called up February and I said, uh, Judy answered the phone. I said, Judy, would you put your mom on the phone? She said, oh, Patty, we were getting ready to call you. Mom died. And she said, Patty, I know the routine. <laughs> and I said, happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday, precious Patty. Happy birthday to me. And I said, thank you, Bob Terry, for saving my life. And Judy said, Patty, Bob didn't save your life. God saved your life. He was only the messenger. And I said, shut up, Judy, and say thank you. And she said, thank you. She said, same time next year. I said, yeah. <laughs> this program works. The program works. People don't work. The program works. If you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. That's what they told me. That's the only message I tell you. Find a God. Find a God. If you're like Patty Lacascio, your God is going to have many faces by the time you're 21 years sober. And by the time I'm 30 or 40 or 50 years sober, with the, by the grace of God, I think my God will have many different faces. Bob Terry was one of those faces. Katie Haygood is one of those faces. Barb is one of those faces. That ugly sponsor of hers, Arlene T., is one of those faces. <laughs> See? And i got to tell you a little story. I promised, but I lie a lot. I promised that... Uh, that I take, but I tell you this one little story. I come from an area of Washington D.C. where 30 miles away is the most beautiful area on God's green earth. It's called the Chesapeake Bay, and it is gorgeous. And when we were kids in the summertime, my father and my beautiful, beautiful stepmother and my beautiful step grandmother would take us down there. We would eat hard shell crabs, and I used to go out and back. And there was a big, big black man. He was so big and so tall. He was like a mountain. And he would take bushels of crabs and he would pour them into 55-gallon drums and he'd put the burlap over and he'd put a cayenne pepper and he'd hose them down and put them over the big open fire and he'd steam those crabs. And I'd sit and watch him. He just, he just, I just love watching that man work. And one day when he went and took the bushel of crabs and poured them in the big 55-barrel drum, drum, when he put the bushel basket back down on the ground, there was three, four crabs left in the bushel basket, and I remember saying to him, Mr., Mr., there's those crabs, those crabs, and I had such a speech impediment, I could hardly get it out, and I said, those crabs, those crabs, they're going to get out, they're going to get out, they're going to escape and go back in the water, and he looked at me, and I remember what he said, and he said, oh, baby girl, he said, don't worry about them crabs, he says, crabs is just like people's. He said, one of them crabs go to escape out of that bushel basket, and that other crab will reach up and pull him right back down. <laughs> now, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have winners and we have crabs. The winner will jump into the bushel basket, help push your ass over the top, and then try to figure out how to get out himself. And the crab will pull you right back down. Stick with the winners. I love you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.